Hello, and welcome to China Forum, the leading program for discussing the latest in trends and developments in China's economics, politics, culture, and society. I'm Emily O'Brien, and I'll be your program moderator for today. On today's episode of China Forum, we will be discussing China's increasing involvement in the international arena, as well as what it means for China to become a responsible global stakeholder as a world power. I'm pleased to welcome our expert guest for today, Dr. David M. Lampton. Good to be with you. Dr. Lampton is Hyman Professor and Director of China Studies at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, where he also heads SICE China, the school's overall presence in Greater China. Chairman of the Asia Foundation, former President of the National Committee of, on U.S.-China Relations, and former Dean of Faculty at SICE, he's the author of multiple books on China. Dr. Lampton received his BA, MA, and PhD degrees from Stanford University. Dr. Lampton, thank you for joining us today. So let's jump right in. Um, as we know, involvement in international uh, organizations, in particular the UN, um, is often used as a gauge for a uh, country's willingness to be a responsible global stakeholder. Uh, recently, China dispatched its first infantry contribution to a UN peacekeeping mission uh, in South Sudan in January. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi also mentioned last year that China is considering making helicopters and for the first time Air Force personnel available to UN peacekeeping missions. Um, what do you think is driving this new commitment to these UN peacekeeping missions? Why now? Well, I think a, a number of things. First of all, of course, the world as China's been getting stronger and wealthier and has uh, so much foreign exchange. Um, China has capabilities it never had before. And therefore, in some sense, the world is to be a responsible stakeholder involved providing public goods. Mm -hmm. And so China's even using the vocabulary of international public goods, security, mm -hmm. humanitarian assistance, civilian ev evacuations as occurred with Libya, for example. Uh, so the, part of the reason is China has more capabilities. Part of the reason is the world is demanding it in a sense. Um, but in all, as in all things in life, you have to be careful what you ask for. Mm -hmm. If you ask for China to become more involved, of course, in certain circumstances, China is going to become involved in ways that you might not have preferred or in areas you wish they had not done so. So uh, while on the one hand it's a good sign of China's global involvement, of course, uh, it can both promote cooperation in some cases and in other cases uh, raise issues about what China's underlying motives may be. But on balance, I think you have to say it's a good thing. And whether or not it's always a good thing, it's inevitable as China gets more interest in the world, it will want to shape outcomes in increasingly areas distant from China. That's, that's a very good point about, you know, it might not always look like what we want it to look like. Right. Along those lines, uh, the United States also has interests in South Sudan, um, as well as in, for example, the Middle East, where China has been getting more involved recently. Um, obviously, more peacekeepers in these regions is a good thing, but what security concerns do you think might China's increasing involvement raise for the United States? Well, and also, I think we have to ask what security concerns does the United uh, does China have about the United States? And just to focus on that for a minute, mm -hmm. of course, the United States is endeavoring to lower its profile and I would say uh, withdraw its military presence from Afghanistan. Well, a small part of Afghanistan hits China, and China is com very concerned about what will fill the vacuum in Afghanistan as the United States leaves. So in this case, China is actually looking for opportunities to cooperate on development issues in Afghanistan. Afghanistan has investments there. It doesn't want to see uh, Islamic fundamentalism spill over into China itself. So as the United States leaves, it has to begin to think in some cases, Afghanistan most particularly, how it can cooperate. Now, of course, the United States is, is, uh, has its concerns because, first of all, the Middle East is terribly important to the United States for energy directly still, even though our situation is changing for the better. And many of our allies, and all of our allies in Europe and Japan, depend tremendously on stability in the Middle East. So we want to make sure that China is a force for stability there. In that case, I think we have quite a few common interests with China. China also depends on the Middle East for a substantial chunk of its energy imports in Africa as well, and therefore has an interest in stability in this region. 
So we sh we'll, we'll certainly have frictions, uh, and China would have a different attitude towards Iran, for instance, than the United States, and that raises proliferation and so forth. But we have some substantial overlapping interests. Stability in the region, I think, is one of them. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have some competitive interests that we'll have to manage. You mentioned Africa. Um, recently, China has also been increasing its involvement in investment and in infrastructure projects in Africa as well as in Latin America. Um, do you see this, this increased level of projects as mostly self-serving for China, or do you think there's also an aspect of China rep reputation building for China there? Well, I suppose uh, most directly both of those things, reputation building and self-interested. Uh, I think the humanitarian component is probably uh, lesser consideration. Uh, but frankly, uh, it, most countries' uh, development assistance has a combination of uh, economic self-interest, uh, humanitarianism, and strategic interest. So China's not uh, different in the sense that it, it engages in development and uh, involvement with developing countries for many reasons, not all mm -hmm. entirely noble. Uh, but I think uh, I, I take my cue on this set of issues from both a study done at the World Bank on China's involvement in Africa and my colleague here at Johns Hopkins, uh, Deborah Browdingham, on Chinese involvement in Africa. And uh, it, it is true that uh, the Chinese have less conditionality mm -hmm. than the Washington consensus uh, has traditionally been. Uh, less rigorous on environmental standards, uh, worker rights, and so forth. I think this is uh, generally true. Uh, on the other hand, the Chinese, and they mix business and development assistance. Mm -hmm. There are packages, and the government is acting to coordinate industry investment and so forth. So it's a sort of development policy driven by the government. But the key aspect of what China brings to Africa is it knows how to do business. And it's teaching, in a sense, mm -hmm. Africa how to do business and helping them build the capacity. Now, there are all the abuses or, let us say, uh, unwise policies that the U.S. went through early in its development assistance mm -hmm. history. The Chinese often uh, try to uh, monopolize the labor. Uh, you get uh, sort of um, communities of Chinese workers uh, hanging together, doing the work, and the local communities often don't feel as involved as they might. You also get Chinese building show projects for dictators and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, overall, net, I think most of the serious studies that have looked at it is if you ask the question, is Africa better off for China's involvement or not? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes, it's better off. And you have to ask yourself candidly, how interested was the United States and the West in Africa until China started showing interest, mm -hmm. right? So uh, maybe a little bit of a competition there would be good for the Africans. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, humanitarian issues in uh, your answer. And on that note, there is a lot of disagreement about the extent to which Beijing actually cares about China's global image, particularly when you place um, things like its involvement in Africa, or the recent evacuation in Yemen with human rights abuses in Tibet and elsewhere. Um, how much do you think China really cares, and how much should it care about its image globally? Well, uh, actually, I think China cares a lot. Uh, and I think we can see that it cares a lot. Now, you have to, if you're China or any other country, you have to have some priorities. Mm -hmm. If they define something as absolutely core to their national interests, uh, and particularly their security interests, then, of course, whether they look good or bad in the eyes of the world will be a secondary consideration. Uh, you could say uh, Tiananmen was a perfect example. Mm -hmm. If they're forced to choose how they look on global TV or maintain order in China, there's, I don't think they believe they have much of a decision to make. And I think in the same sense in, in the world. But I think we can see that China actually cares a lot. First of all, internally, there's a huge discussion about how to increase soft power. The notion mm -hmm. of hard power, military force is essentially coercive, it's alienating. Soft power is attractive, persuasive. And basically, soft power is cheaper to, to manufacture and to exercise than hard power. Mm -hmm. So I think they have a, a desire to have persuasive capability. And if you ask, well, what's, 
what are some of the examples of this? I think, uh, for instance, the United States for many years has had the hospital ship Hope, mm -hmm. and it's been a great symbol of American humanitarianism. China has now the Peace Ark, and it sails around the world uh, helping people and, and so forth. So I think you can see that China uh, cares in that sense. Also, uh, China endeavors to uh, make sure that international organizations never condemn China. Mm -hmm. China is very concerned about its image. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, China is not just one thing. It has lots of actors. Mm -hmm. So individual actors, you can have exploited corporations. They don't care necessarily mm -hmm. so much about China's soft power. Uh, they, the, the military, when it comes to an issue that's close to their heart, sovereignty, they don't really care what Southeast Asia has to say. Mm -hmm. What I think you have to say is China, in that respect, is like everybody else. It, all things considered, it wants to be respected. It wants to be mm -hmm. part of the club. But there are certain interests that they would rather have a bad image and prevail according to their interests. Uh, but all things being equal, China would prefer to s persuade rather than coerce. On the subject of uh, interests uh, intersecting with you know, reputation building, um, depending on what region we're looking at, China seems to have a slightly different reputation, you know, when we're in Africa versus, for example, South and Southeast Asia, particularly with South China Sea issues. Um, how is China's reputation building and uh, stakeholder building in the global arena been different than, for example, its efforts to re-become the great Asian power? Well, uh, I think maybe one way to look at it is, of course, China, I think, thinks more about its region than the entire world, but, but the area of its concern is growing. So we're seeing an increasingly globalized uh, uh, perspective in China. But still the region is, I think, the most important, and China's the hub, in its view, mm -hmm. of the region. And I think you can see this in their uh, new Xi Jinping uh, new policy of one belt, one road, for instance. Uh, basically, this is a network of land infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, that would reach to South, e South Asia uh, through Pakistan, uh, and therefore avoid the Malacca Straits, among other things, and transship oil across pipelines that have been, are being built and been built in Burma. Uh, there's even talk of building a canal in, uh, across the isthmus in, in Thailand. Uh, there's contemplated uh, three rail lines to Singapore from southern China, uh, one of which, the middle route through uh, Laos and Thailand, looks like it has quite a prospect of occurring. The other two may be more problematic. And then, of course, maritime routes, and mm -hmm. we see China now uh, taking land reefs and piling up the sand and creating artificial islands and, mm -hmm. and let us say, infrastructure, both military and civilian, presumably. Um, so we see them moving. And then, of course, in Central Asia, you've already completed one rail line uh, across Central Asia into uh, Europe mm -hmm. uh, or to Europe. So uh, China sees itself as a hub, and it's building the, the uh, connectivity both to Europe, to South Asia, Southeast Asia, and trying to multiply its, um, its uh, modes of delivery of strategic resources so it can't face a bottleneck imposed by the United States or anybody else, mm -hmm. uh, and it still has transportation alternatives. But more importantly, it opens up new markets for China, and they're very worried about employment and growth and exports. So uh, I think uh, if I was giving advice to the U.S. government, I would be say, saying we need to be part of building this connectivity. Mm -hmm. This is going to have political impacts in all these regions. It's going to have economic opportunity associated with it. It's going to have contracts in building it all. Mm -hmm. uh, and so rather than opposing it, Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is a fair, uh, a good policy China's pursuing it from its own interests, and we need to uh, not, we have to recognize that the world needs infrastructure, China's willing to help build it, and we need to be part of it. Mm -hmm. 
You mentioned that uh, the U.S. needs to be getting involved in this, which is a great point. And a lot of people have criticized the U.S. Uh, with regards to its reaction to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank um, and how it moved away from that initially. Uh, what role do you see the AIIB playing um, mm -hmm. in addition to One Belt, One Road yeah. in terms of China's growing involvement? Yeah. Well, I, I, I generally try to be understanding about how politics unfolds and frequently uh, strange things happen. But I would have to say this is one of the strangest things. Uh, uh, let us say um, it was not a diplomatic success. I mean, you can't count as a diplomatic success uh, putting your reputation on the line to oppose something and then having 57 countries, most of which are your allies, uh, defect and, in effect, go forward. Now, the administration has backed off and said we will cooperate and so forth. I think that's the right policy. They've ended up in the right place. And there is the practical fact that the U.S. Congress wouldn't oppose, in, uh, wouldn't ap uh, approve a budget item for uh, uh, joining the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So there are practical considerations. But this was not the brightest shining moment in U.S. Uh, foreign policy uh, recently. Um, so I think the United States, though, ought to be as cooperative with these kind of organizations as possible. And it raises the larger issue. And that is, of course, in 2005, the U.S. said we want China to be a increasing stakeholder in the international community. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, they're doing so. They're putting money there for a, um, a category of need, infrastructure building, that everybody recognizes is needed uh, in the world. And so I think this is one of those cases where uh, you, we're going to have to choose between getting China involved in the international community and us necessarily dominating or having primacy over all of the institutions that are built. Uh, and so I think our real challenge is how to get the United States and China working together in these institutions rather than trying to oppose them. That's a very good point. Um, and along those lines, how should the U.S. be trying to balance its wariness of China um, with its desire for China to take responsibility for things like the environment and the global economy? Um, do you think it's hypocritical to demand that China step up and then get defensive when it does? I don't know if it's hypocritical, but it, it, it isn't very effective policy. <laughs> and, and, of course, the United States has many actors, too. President Obama probably has one set of views, and certainly the U.S. Congress isn't going to appropriate money mm -hmm. for many of those things, and he just has to li live with that reality. So in politics, sometimes it, the word hypocrisy doesn't get you very far because you have different actors and they can throw up vetoes and roadblocks and one party can really relatively do little to overcome the situation. So I don't see it as hypocrisy, but I do see it as a, a U.S. system that doesn't have a high degree of consensus over either how China's behaving in the world or what kind of China we can work with and so forth. Now, thus far, the burden of the conversation has sound like it, it's mostly U.S. hang-ups and problems here. L let's be clear, China is doing some things in the world that are not making people entirely confident. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the South China Sea, the East China Sea, uh, domestic tightening up, uh, all raise the question, is China going in the right direction? How will China exercise its increasing power in the world? And this is not clear. Mm -hmm. I think we had a greater degree of confidence uh, in preceding administrations. And it seems that Xi Jinping is leading China in a different direction, a more assertive direction, mm -hmm. um, a more tightening of internal politics in China. And I think the United States for the last administrations since Richard Nixon went, basically had an underlying consensus about China plus C, and that was be patient because China's going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Now, June 4th, of course, shook our confidence here, but basically Deng Xiaoping pushed things back onto track, and George Herbert Walker Bush helped, and you had two leaders that wanted to push things back mm -hmm. on track. But now, it seems that we have a leader that uh, maybe isn't pushing things back on track in China.
Mm -hmm. And therefore, this, this consensus in the United States that was created when we thought China's going in the right direction, when a, a significant percentage of Americans think maybe China's not going in the right direction, then all your policy prescriptions begin to break down. Everything becomes contentious. Mm -hmm. Should we help China in it? Should, if China wants to do something, should our predisposition be to pre oppose it? So I think we are at a very delicate point where um, it's important for China to reassure the world and its region that it's going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And right now, I don't, I think there's a lot of worry. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point. Um, you mentioned the uh, Xi Jinping's uh, domestic issues and internal politics in China. Um, to what extent do these domestic issues, um, things like Tiananmen or you know more recent issues within China, to what extent do they affect China's international politics and global yeah. agenda? I sort of have a rule of thumb uh, that you can't understand any nation's foreign policy without first most fundamentally understanding its domestic self-image, its own idea about where it is and its development process, what its interests mm -hmm. are, and the domestic politics. Point. And so I don't think China's one iota different than the United States in that regard. We would never dream of explaining uh, U.S. foreign policy without pretty early on saying a Democrat's in the White House mm -hmm. and the Republicans control Capitol Hill and they don't agree and we're having a big fight, right? I mean, that'd yep. be almost the beginning explanation of any policy issue. Mm -hmm. And then you might secondly say Americans uh, are not happy with the prospect of uh, a lesser role in the world. They're not happy with outsourcing. Well, China is not one bit different. Now, who the actors are and what their lenses and in interests are, those are different. But I don't think you can understand what Xi Jinping is doing without reference to at least how he understands his own domestic circumstance. Nobody in the outside world has a full understanding about how Xi Jinping understands his political circumstance and how other actors interact. But I think we understand a few things, and that is that Xi Jinping is still trying to consolidate power. He fears for the future of the Chinese Communist Party. He's tightening up uh, what have proved to be threatening social groups. He and China have learned some lessons about that, and they're trying to nip in the bud these kind of groups that uh, have been associated with instability and regime change elsewhere. He sees himself as the patron, as the protector of the role of the Chinese Communist Party in governing a stable and developing China. And so everything he's doing, whether it's the new NGO law that might, uh -huh. might impact uh, associations dealing with China all over the world, or it's the state security law, mm -hmm. these are all coming out of the domestic political circumstance. And he's also brought along with him in his rise to the top. He accumulated friends and associates on his rise to the top. And now he's surrounded by a group of people that we really don't know and feel as comfortable with as we did the last group for the last 40 years, mm -hmm. right? So we don't have a full picture of what the details are and the dynamics and so forth. But I think that what we're seeing in terms of China's behavior is, is largely determined by China's internal politics. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I think in all fairness needs to be said, when the United States or others like Japan take actions in the outside world, uh, Japan, quote, nationalizes the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands, mm -hmm. of course, China reacts to that or the U.S. adopts a pivot policy and says it's going to strengthen its military and other dimensions of its power projection. So there is a reactive component, that is, where China has interests and it responds to threats. There is a reactive component. But when all is said and done, a lot of the day-to-day -day and general trend of Chinese foreign policy, I think, is, reflects domestic politics. Mm -hmm. So the environment actually represents one area where the U.S. and China have managed to put forth a plan that recognizes their joint responsibilities mm -hmm. as world powers. Um, do you see any other areas where this sort of cooperation could or should occur? 
first of all, let me just say on the climate change uh, agreement uh, between the two presidents uh, at the APEC meetings in, in uh, late last year, in uh, 2014, I thought that was a very good agreement. And for the first time, China at least told the world when it will make sure it will stop adding uh, uh, to the carbon load of, of the global system. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it's, a, it's also true that China, in effect, committed to what its plan already was. It didn't change its plan, but it did commit. And it said it would try to beat what it agreed to. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's all positive, and it certainly gets us off the, uh, the, the deadlock we had after the Kyoto agreements earlier on, which were pretty much a, a fiasco. As to other areas where one can see such cooperation, I think the United States and China have actually cooperated pretty well in keeping um, the global economy on a fairly even keel. Now, this isn't to deny all of the problems that China's own internal system, or for that matter, her own, uh, have. Uh, but the United States is reducing its deficit, at least for the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and China is rebalancing its economy, albeit gradually. Uh, and China is trying to keep up at the same time growth, because we're the two growth engines of the world mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. So actually, I think the Chinese and the Americans have been doing okay on global economic management. Now, one area where I think we could be better, frankly, is uh, China now is the world's second biggest economy, uh, by some measures, uh, maybe the first or soon to be the first largest economy. Uh, and yet China only has about 3% of the IMF votes because of the agreement uh, on, on Bretton Woods. It was a complex and it evolves, the voting shares evolve slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think we have to recognize that China's role in the global economy has changed, and therefore its role in international financial institutions, most notably the IMF, I think we have to adjust that. Congress, the U.S. Congress, has been resistant to that. That's just a thumb in the eye to the Chinese. There's mm -hmm. really no justification for that. China, I think you you can have your complaints about IPR theft, which are justified. You can have your complaint about some dumping uh, that the Chinese do when they get over capacity, like in steel. You can ha there are lots of things we don't like uh, and aren't right. But on the other hand, as a broad force in the global economy, China has been uh, constructive. In any case, it's important, and therefore it has to be reflected in its power. So I think we have to adjust China's voice in these. Uh, let it let it increase. Now, uh, you know, that'll raise the question, there, therefore, do we lower Italy's vote? Or whose vote goes down if China's goes up? And this is, of course, every country is self-interested when that's the question. Mm -hmm. But the United States ought to stand for basically uh, the broad principle that uh, your importance in the global economy ought to be reflected in your importance in the management institutions of mm -hmm. the the global system. Great explanation on a complicated issue. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Lampton for joining us and really breaking down this issue. Um, my name is Emily O'Brien, and we'll see you next time on China Forum.